Well, together we've been going through the revised common lectionary and it's a, a good discipline to bring to our congregation and to our denomination as was uh, mentioned uh, some time ago by Mike Rasmussen, our director for North America. It was uh, throughout our small and scattered denomination, there was a lot of uh, variance. Uh, you could find folks uh, preaching on everything from diet to uh, political information and so forth. And we want to be uh, making sure that across the board, we are as Christ-centered as possible. And the uh, Revised Common Lectionary is, is, I don't claim that it is inspired from above. Uh, I do believe though it is inspiring in that we have received from above the scriptures. And so when somebody says, let's all read this scripture together and let's think about what it means for us as Christians, as community. Uh, that, that works very well for me, and I hope it works very well for you. As we look through uh, the assignments for this week, of course, there's something from the Psalms, something from the Gospels, uh, something from Paul's writings, and uh, a lot of emphasis uh, in discussion about uh, Paul's writings. And I got to admit, I just was forced to gravitate back towards the Gospel passage for this week, uh, which we find in the book of Mark chapter 4 and verse 26. And uh, this is, uh, again, an excerpt from Jesus' public ministry. And we're going to read a couple of parables together and ask a few questions about them. So beginning in Mark 4, 26, let's read together. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, which with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. And some traditions, uh, uh, the reader would add simply the words, may God add his blessing to the reading of the word. And uh, we should ask that today as we look at these parables. There's a, uh, an old saying, uh, it's attributed to Benjamin Franklin, although I think it crops up in other cultures as well. For one of a nail, the shoe was lost. For one of a shoe, the horse was lost. For one of a horse, the rider was lost. For one of a rider, the message was lost. For one of a message, the battle was lost. For one of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. And that conventional wisdom that little things matter can be found in many cultures expressed in many different ways. I grew up hearing the expression, a stitch in time saves nine. In other words, pay attention to this small detail right now, Robert, or you're going to have bigger problems somewhere along the line. I suppose in Middle Eastern culture, the expression is, if the nose of the camel comes under the tent flap, well, the humps will shortly follow. And so you have this vivid image of somebody sitting there saying, oh, isn't that cute? We see this warm, fuzzy nose of the, uh, the camel just coming under the tent flap. Let's pat that little nose and let's indulge that camel, not realizing that a moment later, well, the camel may lift its head, rip apart the tent flap, and in comes the camel with its two humps, if it's a dromedary or maybe not a dromedary, either, either way, with its zero humps, one hump or two hump, however that many humps that camel has, in he comes. A stitch which is dropped uh, and you allow to dangle, well, pretty soon it'll run and you'll have to be stitching up nine. And the shoe that 
just as missing one nail could well result in the horse throwing that shoe. And along with that, the rider not being able to carry the message to the general who needs to know that if the battle is to be won and the kingdom saved. And this is very much the feeling that you get from Jesus speaking about the parable of the sower and the seed. You have to go back to the original setting, of course. And uh, of course, back then they didn't have a plastic bucket, but uh, this was sort of an evocative picture uh, of a, uh, a man simply sowing seed by hand. This would have been the way it would be done back then. But consider this. Uh, the message seems to be, despite the odds, keep sowing. Keep on sowing. And don't consider it a trivial and unimportant function of your life. And of course, Jesus is communicating this in the context of its time and place. Again, it's very important as we read scriptures that come to us from 2000 years ago, based on culture that came to them from a thousand or 2000 years before that. And understand that Jesus spoke many similar parables to them as much as they could understand. And then the other times it very explicitly said that he spoke in parables, so it wouldn't be too obvious to the crowd on that particular day what he was saying. Now, that had to be a somewhat nuanced because towards the end of his ministry, he spoke some parables that were so blunt, the Pharisees were livid. They knew exactly what he was saying and he nailed them with the analogy or the uh, uh, illustration he was using uh, when he spoke his parables. Uh, this section from the early part of Mark is written, of course, way after the fact by Mark, maybe 15 or 20 years later. But in retrospect, Mark is summarizing the reality that in that time and that place, people were used to hearing parables. They were used to the everyday illustrations because they could relate to the stories and they got a certain amount out of them but they didn't necessarily get all there was to get on that particular day. Looking back, the disciples didn't necessarily get everything. And they, of course, often came to him and says, when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. And I think it might be fair to add our own comment here uh, that uh, in retrospect, Mark is really saying, yeah, he explained everything, but we didn't quite get it even then. And we sort of see it now very clearly after the fact. Uh, parables and the ministry of Jesus for them was best understood, were best understood in retrospect. And that's the way it worked for them. And so as we go to these parables of the sower and the seed, we realize that there are some lessons that are still valid for you and for me, and that we can eventually wrap our minds around the meaning of these particular stories that Jesus told and understand that they meant a great deal in their time and their place to the disciples. And of course, eventually to those who through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit were able to read Mark's account and pick up and understand what Jesus was going for. What is he saying though, that's not just relevant to them, but relevant to you and me? Well, first of all, he says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. There are a lot of parables that give us a, a glimpse into the kingdom of God. And I like to explain it this way. It's as if each insight is just a whisker of truth. And if you walk around the entire story of the kingdom, taking all the parables, you get a glance here, a glance here, a glance here, which is why some parables sound similar, but Jesus varies the details. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is like what a, a king who goes into a far country and before he leaves uh he he gives each of his servants uh, a talent a pound well uh, is that the way it really is well another parable says he goes into a far kingdom and gives one two talents another five talents another ten talents things like that so which is true well they're all true they offer a little sliver of information and no parable taken by itself is the ultimate statement of truth uh, about the entire story of the kingdom of God. But the insights we gain from this one are it's like 
you know, it, it reminds me of Walter Mezzarenko, a deacon in the uh, Westlock congregation, which I pastored many years ago. And he was always fond of saying when he was trying to sort of straighten somebody out and he had a very gentle way, but he would begin by saying, it's, it's, it's this way here. And this is Jesus saying, when it comes to my kingdom, it's this way here. A man scatters seed on the ground. And he's not just speaking of himself. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. The kingdom of heaven is like a man scattering seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed grows, though he does not know how. Now, if you're in the original time and place thinking about a kingdom, what do you understand the kingdom to be? Well, that would be the kingdom of Rome, which dominates the entire earth. That's a kingdom. But Jesus now turns that concept right up its, on, on top of its head. And he said, no, it's, my kingdom is not like the kingdom of Rome. It's not like the kingdom that Herod rules over. It's not like any kingdom you're familiar with. It starts with small seeds. And in your life, you will not be dominating the society in which you live. You will not be uh, uh, overcoming uh, the Roman Empire, or in your case, uh, Revelation says we, we live in Babylon. Uh, the church finds itself in the midst of a world that is not wholly under the sway of Jesus and uh, motivated by the Holy Spirit. Rather, we find ourselves in a world that is well, kind of corrupt, kind of disreputable, uh, needs to be uh, restarted from the very beginning. Uh, it says uh, that we need to anticipate a new heavens and a new earth. But this kingdom has begun, and it's begun like a little seed here and a little seed there. And in your life, you and I will not turn the Roman Empire up on its ear. We will not turn the world up on its ear either. We will not reverse that which is happening around us. But just like a quiet sliver of light in the darkness, just like a pinch of salt in the midst of a rather uh, bland or tasteless meal, uh, we bring something to wherever we happen to be. And it doesn't matter what it is we bring, that seed is deposited and we don't know what happens. We don't know what follows. Just like a farmer may plant a seed, but whether he's asleep or he's awake, the seed starts to grow it sprouts and he doesn't quite know what's going on there he, he he can't make it grow faster he can't make it grow slower if it's a weed see he really can't he um he just knows that something's going to happen if he puts a seed in the ground something's going to happen eventually and he just prays that it'll be good and it's the same for you and for me we do little things here and there that reflect our belief in the kingdom uh, we do small acts of service here and there motivated by the holy spirit we bring little moments of truth motivated again by the holy spirit understanding that the kingdom is coming from heaven but we are on the earth and we are not very strong against the forces of evil uh, the best we can do is to overcome those forces. That is to say, like Jesus, he said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Uh, if you looked around, you'd say, wait, wait a second, Lord, the world's still here. The Romans are still here. Evil is still present. And Jesus might in the vernacular of today may respond, well, it didn't get to me, did it? It doesn't have to get to you. And the influence of you, my little ray of sunshine, my little moment of seed is that something will germinate as a result. And well, you don't know what might, that might be. You have no control over the outcome. You have no control over where I may be working or what I may be doing. But I'll guarantee you this, my will will be done. And my will is that, that germinate, that seed take hold. 
and something might, and maybe you'll live long enough, or maybe you'll have the privilege of seeing a stalk. Okay. Maybe you'll never see the head <laughs> come to fruition. You'll never see a full corn, kernel uh, developing. But I will guarantee you this in my kingdom, things will happen. And they will happen with you, and they will happen through you, but they will be happening because of me, my work in the earth. Paul, Paul puts it perfectly uh, when he talked about ministry. He said, Apollos planted, no, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And Paul didn't know where his actions would lead, but churches were planted, people's lives were changed as a result of a dynamic ministry that. God did through him. You don't know where your actions will leave, but you are a dynamic ministry as long as the Holy Spirit is with you and working in you and working flowing through you. And as soon as the grain is ripe, well, it's time for the sickle because the harvest has come. But it is my harvest. It is my work from start to finish, and it is my harvest. So just be content to be the one who brings a little light, a little salt, or maybe plants a little seed. Relax. You have no control over the outcome. Uh, take comfort. Uh, I am the one who is going to see the increase happens because that's my will. You just do what is right. And good things will follow. Maybe in your lifetime, maybe in the lifetime that your children and grandchildren will see the results. Paul reflects on this when he says this in uh, Galatians. He says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Wow, I've uh, heard so many stories of people who just uh, continue to love against the odds continue to give, even though others were more than willing to grab and receive in ways that were inappropriate. I uh, have had many interactions. I, I, I think of the young lady whose uh, dad uh, sadly uh, uh, almost fell off the grid, gave himself over to drugs, gave himself over to indolence, and of course, there were certain mental issues that began to uh, come about. What began as sort of what seemed like an excuse, you know, social anxiety disorder, uh, which sounds kind of wimpy when you say it real fast that way, but it, it is a, a real factor for some people. But uh, after a little while, he, uh, uh, complicated by drug abuse, I'm sure, but uh, he was uh, considered to be. Uh, pretty much in need of uh, state support. And so he was on medication for what developed into full-blown schizophrenia. Um, but of course, he being a stubborn and obnoxious individual in his actions uh, was very difficult to deal with. But his daughter continued to try in her way to be kind and considerate. She didn't consider it a Christian act, she just considered it a daughterly act. Uh, sadly, the last time I heard uh, her father had gone to visit her at a time of distress and supposedly to help out. And, uh, of course, he was going through one of his stubborn phases and decided he didn't need medication. There was nothing really wrong with him, which, of course, is a terrible contradiction because I'm very willing, you might say, to accept a, a pension, a stipend, uh, uh, a welfare support of some kind or another because... I need it, I'm sick, but I don't need medication because I'm not sick. As a result of that, there was a terrible blow up. Uh, he disrupted her family life, disrupted her friends at the time when she needed a lot of help. I think she was moving house at the time and supposedly he came to help and he was a colossal disruption and hindrance. And in tears, pretty much, he explained to me how hurtful it was, especially since uh, her, her grandmother uh, chastened her for not being as kind as she could be or as considerate as she ought to be uh, for her dad. And so this whole thing swirled around. But you know, the poor kid, and I, I refer to her as a kid, she's in her early to, early 20s, I believe at the time, 
uh, continue to try very hard, especially if we have to practice restraint, to manage the situation, to be helpful through all of that. Uh, boy, I tell you, if I was in her tiny shoes, I would be weary in well-doing. I would be weary in doing good. But she just continued to sow the seeds of love and hope that must have only been placed there by her, her, her mom and her dad. I beg your pardon, not her dad. He was the problem. Uh, perhaps her grandmother and grandfather, people like that. And she, uh, she just kept up the good work. And I know that uh, when she looked in the mirror, uh, her, her heart did not reproach her. When she talked to her younger sister, you know, she didn't have controversy. When she talked to her own mother, there was distress. Uh, she could say, simply say to her extended family, I, I did my best. I did my best. I continue to love against the odds. I pray for somebody like that going through circumstances. I, I think of... Um, a number of men, number of women I've talked to over the years who have endured through difficult uh, marriages. And under no circumstances do I encourage people to continue through abuse, uh, through uh, mistreatment. Uh, you have to have a sense of God's love, uh, which is not to submit to abuse and intolerance. But it does say try very hard not to give in to bitterness and recrimination and anger and striking back. Don't become weary in well-doing. Don't cease to plant the seed. There is a harvest of righteousness that you can still reap even through difficult circumstances. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. And notice Paul limits this as we have opportunity. Uh, there's not always the opportunity to be that just wonderful, wonderful person who we know, we feel as though we've blessed everybody and everybody appreciates us as a blessing. But let us do continue to do good. Let's not get weary in doing good, especially to those who belong to the family of believers, or as other translations put it, the household of faith. And so if we're going to live a life and we're going to be the seed of the kingdom and spread the seeds of the kingdom, then we have to be mentally tough enough to know that the love of God does not necessarily produce a harvest overnight. In fact, we're going to have to have faith, just like the farmer who doesn't know how that seed grows or maybe where some of those seeds fell and how they might spring forth. Nonetheless, in the words of Jesus, it's kind of like that with the kingdom. Allow it to grow. Don't judge the work of God. Don't enter into a passionate argument with yourself as to how futile it is to do good. Listen to the words of our Savior who on the Sermon on the Mount said, hey, sometimes you will be despitefully used. Don't give in to the desire to despitefully use back. Don't give in to the desire to strike back and to hurt and to damage. Don't become weary while doing. And he went on to say in this, in this uh, uh, because there are two parables back to back. And again, we realize that these parables are offered not because uh, each of these eyewitnesses to the life of Jesus uh, mark at a distance, but uh, he's, he's listening to the stories that Peter is telling him, Peter being really up close. Uh, Mark was a youngster during this period of time, but he's writing it down. And I imagine Peter said, you know, our Lord was really fond of those parables that leaned on the agricultural understanding that was so common to the audience of the day. And he told this one, then he told this one. Well, did he tell one or the other? He told both. What day did he tell it? He told it time and time again. The audience changed it almost every day. Mark, stop being so literal here. You know, tell this one and then tell this one. Write it down. And then you can say that, boy, we were really, well, okay, you better clean that up. Let's just express it this way. And I can imagine Peter mentoring Mark and pulling together this, this very earliest of the gospel accounts. 
But anyway, back to uh, Mark chapter 4 and verse 30. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? Okay, Lord, what parable shall you use? Again, he draws on the fact that it begins with the most insignificant of gestures, which communicates to you and to me that no gesture is insignificant. The smallest act of service, the smallest gesture of kindness, it's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Now, I can't vouch for that fact, but uh, to the audience of that day, apparently they all accepted a reality that seeds can be as big as a pine cone, I guess, or as small as a mustard seed. Now, anything smaller than a mustard seed, Levi? Uh, no, Asher, I don't. Well, this is the picture Jesus is setting up in their minds. My kingdom starts this way. My kingdom is like this. Have you ever noticed that the smallest, tiniest little seed grows and becomes the largest of the garden plants? It's, it's, a, it's a bush, it's a tree, it's a honking big thing. Everybody knows that. And if you ever noticed that the big branches are such that the birds can perch in the shade, there's shelter under that tree. You can sit there and eat your lunch. Uh, birds can build their nests. It is a home for all sorts of uh, domestic and wildlife. It's a safe, comfortable. Something grows from something that's so insignificant, you wouldn't give it credit. That's the way my kingdom works. But I want to see a response. I want to see numbers. I want to see an impact. I want to see, well, I'm sorry, son or daughter. I don't work that way. Remember the words of my beloved Apostle Paul. You will see a harvest if you don't become weary and faint. But you'll see it's my harvest. And I am the Lord of the harvest. And I will gather in the harvest when I am ready to gather it. And it may be long after you're gone. But I planted the seed. I deserve to see. You know, my wife had me uh, trimming the uh, apple trees in the backyard again. I did it uh, a year or two ago. I thought they'd never survive. Uh, one of them is right behind my head. Look how plush that tree looks. Just a fantastic uh, looking tree. And this year she had me lop off a few more branches. And I thought, ah, the thing will really die now. But you know something? I'm not going to take another picture because I really like this tree. Uh, this picture of the uh, tree from last year. But it's already greening up and, and just sprouting up and looking really not that bad. And that's the way I am. Hey, I did it a couple of months ago. I want to see results now. Well, not to be, my son, not to be. Uh, the kingdom of God is not like unto an apple tree. The kingdom of God is like the smallest seed. You plant the thing and then you go away. I will make sure somebody else comes along and waters it. But it, I will give the increase, just like the farmer who doesn't know whether he's awake, awake or asleep, what exactly is happening in that field. Why? Because it's my field. So lighten up with your instant expectations. Lighten up with those things. You know, from what was planted, you can look through history and say, the church with all its flaws and all its schisms still has been a blessing in the midst of the earth. Uh, when I think of Canada, when I say Canada is a rapidly Christian nation, uh, not exactly. We have laws that allow all sorts of things that I don't think are godly. But that's an issue that we're not going to tackle right now. But has Canada been defined to some extent or another, despite all the failings, all the weaknesses, all the stumbling and so forth? Has it been defined by what we would call the Judeo-Christian ethic? Yes, it has. And are we better off than just about every other country on earth? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. And so 
you may look and you may say, well, I don't see the fullness of the kingdom. And you will not until the fullness of the kingdom is ushered in by Jesus himself returning to this earth the second time victorious. Uh, picture coming on a white horse as a conquering king who says enough of this happening in my kingdom and creates for all of us a new heavens and a new earth in which you will be blessed with a new body and a new life, life everlasting. But in the meantime, we're sort of seeing good things come from this very flawed church. Many years ago, I took a flight from Edmonton down to Los Angeles, back in the old days when you could fly direct. Mm -hmm. And I sat next to uh, a man who turned out to be a priest. And he was coming back from visiting relatives in Alberta. Mm -hmm. And I'm not Catholic. Mm -hmm. I'm very familiar with 2000 years of Catholic history. Well, not that familiar, but I know enough about it to know that there were vast tracts of really unscrupulous behavior and unrighteousness for which many Protestants like myself have been tempted to say, this is a horrible aberration and was never the church of God. But as I sat next to this man, uh, he had actually taken a vow of poverty, which uh, turned out didn't mean what I thought it meant. He was actually the director of a very, very important and prestigious school in Mexico City. He was on the way back there. And the president and his cabinet members sent their children to that school. And he personally was an advisor to the president of Mexico and uh, uh, offered advice on the new constitution, I think, or tweaking the constitution that was happening at the time. Uh, of course, you may say, you must have taken a vow of poverty if he was sitting next to you, Bob. Where were you? Well, in the uncomfortable seat right at the back of the plane. But he, as we talked at some length, I finally ventured a little guess and, uh, and a, a little comment. I said, well, you know, a lot of weird things have happened with the Catholic Church over the last 2000 years. And he, and he replied, he said, you know, even in the worst of times during the administration of the Borgias, he said, that's when the church broke through to China and broke through to other areas and the gospel spread throughout the earth. And I thought, you know, he's right. For all the flaws, all the, the corruption that may have been happening back in Europe, the church was still spreading the gospel and doing certain things. Does that mean I instantly wanted to drop everything and become Catholic, go to confession and do all sorts of things I don't necessarily uh, agree with? Uh, no. But even as much as I might disagree with certain things about the Catholic church, I realized that there are certain things that in their own way have grown and been accomplished. And now as I help uh, refugees who come from Africa to Canada, where do they get help? Well, they get a certain amount of help from me. They get a certain amount of help from uh, our congregation, uh, way more from our congregation than they get from me to be, to be fair. But they also get help from Catholic social services. Is that a perfect organization? No, but are there people doing good there? Yeah, the smallest of seeds the weirdest of places you might say and even though the farmer doesn't understand it somehow or other this kingdom grows and it offers shelter somehow or other this kingdom grows and it, it makes a difference wherever it may be found and i take that lesson from these two parables i share it with you today and i ask you to consider in your own life is it worth keeping up the good work is it worth doing against everything that screams out in you. I've had enough. Is it worth doing the right thing at the right time with mixed emotions, second guessing yourself, but knowing if our Lord were here, this is what he would do. But I'm not our Lord, therefore. No, no, I am. I am the vessel that he is using. And the answer is overwhelmingly less. Don't lose the battle. Don't let the world overcome you. Rather, consider that this, these parables have been left behind for our emotional and spiritual edification so that we may reflect the character of Jesus himself, that he may live again through us. Whatever you may think of your small mustard seed contribution, 
it's a powerful witness to the kingdom of God. You may not live long enough to see your grandchildren say, wow, you know, I remember when. But rest assured, the Holy Spirit will make sure it happens. We are comforted by the fact that parables may be obscure to others, but he is alone with you and me in our prayer time. And he explains everything. And today he is speaking directly to your mind and to your heart and encouraging you to continue the good work of the kingdom, whatever the opposition may be. And whether or not it's that young lady who uh, endured against the odds and coped with a difficult and dysfunctional family experience, whether it is the young woman or the young man who endured through some very difficult and dysfunctional family experiences and marriage experiences, uh, whether it's the employer who doesn't treat you fairly, yet somehow or other you say, I'm not working for him, I'm working for the Lord. And the example that suddenly sort of sets in the mind of those who work alongside, somehow or other, the work of the kingdom is being accomplished. And eventually, and it may be in the kingdom when somebody thanks you personally for your example, or it may be in your old age when somebody comes to you and says, you know, I remember when. And in being in ministry, I've had a number of those experiences 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, you know, just strange things. I remember when I was first ordained, uh, I was registered to uh, perform marriages. And uh, the very first day I performed a marriage, I did one and uh, literally I had a two church circuit. I got through the morning service. I stopped on my way to the next service and I performed a wedding. Uh, it took an hour to do that. Then I went and I preached. And then afterwards I performed another wedding. It was of a, uh, a youngish man, he was older than me. And he married a woman who had a child. Uh, that uh, I believe that child's name was Lillian, uh, or maybe that was the mother's name. Either way, something really strange happened. You know, 40 plus years later, my wife has an aunt and uncle who she is extremely fond of. They live in Calgary. And the aunt and uncle shared with the neighbors. Uh, the fact that uh, their niece had married a pastor in Edmonton. And the niece uh, uh, and uh, the neighbor asked, well, uh, you know, what's the name? And the aunt and uncle said, well, it's, it's Bob Millman. And the neighbor lady got an odd look on her face and she said, I remember him. He performed my mom and dad's wedding. She was the little girl who would have been eight or nine or 10, something like that, at the second wedding I ever performed on the first day I ever performed weddings. What, what's that all about? That's really weird. Well, I, I must have done a half decent job on the day because she had very pleasant memories. And I believe she communicated to her very, very aged mom and stepfather the fact that I was still alive. And uh, uh, she communicated back through the family that uh, she was grateful for the act of kindness I did on that day. That's kind of funny story, kind of weird story in a way, if you think about the number of years that have passed and the fact that she'd be a neighbor <laughs> to my wife's aunt and uncle. That's the way it is with the kingdom of God. And that's the way it is with the seeds that you may sow into the lives of others. God bless you as you continue to do the work of God in every small way that he asks you to do it. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you today that uh, just as you are planting your kingdom in areas we don't even perceive and understand, you are still thrilled to use us, your vessels. We thank you as Holy Spirit that you lead, you guide, you motivate us, and you give us the strength to endure through difficult times. May that be the case wherever we find employment, wherever we find tension and difficulty. 
wherever we find challenge. Uh, may we be the instruments of your peace, uh, of your, your well-being. May we be those who plant the seeds of your kingdom wherever you may cause them to take root. And may you cause a bountiful harvest to come to pass through our quiet, simple, humble lives. And we thank you for the promise that we too one day will stand next to you and see the results of your work and know that you did it a little tiny bit at a time through each of us. We ask your strength and your encouragement and your power within us and through us to see your kingdom come to its fullness. We ask this today in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.